In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you once again for another beautiful day, another opportunity for each one of us to gather in the school of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you give us each day to gather together as one family. Even though we are in different parts of the world, through technology, we are able to unite in this classroom to listen to your word, to share our testimonies, and most of all, Lord God, to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. As we begin this class, Spirit of God, make this teaching simple and easy to understand. Anoint my heart and my lips, nothing of me, everything of you. And let my brothers and sisters, together with me, be taught by the Holy Spirit and apply all that we learn in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So brothers and sisters, today our gospel is from John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. And we are continuing on this gospel, which we began yesterday from John 50, 15, from verses 1 to 8. And yesterday, from 1 to 8, we saw that Jesus is talking about being the true vine, and we, each one of us who believe in him, are the branches. And he says, unless we abide in him, we cannot bear any fruit. We must abide in Jesus. And the way he talks about abiding in him is through his living word. And in today's gospel, he talks about the greatest commandment that he showed us with his own example. And that is the commandment of love. So we pick up the gospel from verse number nine onwards. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. So Jesus is saying, we need to abide in his love. And yesterday we learned the Greek word that which was translated abide simply means to remain. So we need to remain in his love. And what an amazing promise this is, brothers and sisters, from Jesus when he says that the father loves him and when we believe in him, he loves us the same way he loves Jesus. I want to say that again. Jesus says the father loves him. And when we believe in Jesus, the heavenly father loves us the same way as he loves his son, Jesus. And if we go to the book of Hebrews, brothers and sisters, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, the gospel writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means that if Jesus said these words to his disciples 2,000 years ago, he is saying the same thing to you and me today. Remain in my love. So it becomes our responsibility to remain in his love. Because he never stops loving us. Jesus never stops loving us. The love of God is constant. It is never changing. Because that's what it says. The word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when Jesus says to remain in his love, the word remain means abide in his love. That's what we read. Abide in my love. And how do we abide in his love? We abide in his love just like how we studied yesterday. That we can abide in Jesus by abiding in his word. And that's exactly what the book of John, the first book of John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read that. 
but whoever obeys his word truly in this person the love of god has reached perfection by this we may be sure that we are in him so the love of god has been made perfect in us how when we obey his word when we believe his word anyone who believes the word of god will obviously respond to that word which is believing and obey it so in order to have the perfect love of god within us we must believe the word and that's exactly what saint john is talking in his in his epistle he says the love of god is perfected in us when we believe in the word and that's again what jesus is saying when we abide in him we are abiding in his living word now listen to this brothers and sisters in order for us to remain in the love of god it is not that we are waiting on god to do something special we it is becomes our responsibility to believe the word and to remain in the love of god most of the time we are we always pray that god will pour his love into us but when we understand according to scripture that the love of god is poured into our hearts only by the holy spirit and the holy spirit is given to us when we believe in jesus now when we accept jesus as our lord god and savior this is the time that we are going to experience his perfect love so to remain in god's love is not the responsibility of god it is our own responsibility now if you tell a natural person to remain in his love they will say how can the jesus say that just as the father loves him he can love us the same it looks impossible so how does jesus say that just as the father loves him he loves us the same the reason being is because god's love brothers and sisters is an unconditional love the love of god is not based on our performance it is not based on what we do it's not based on our personal holiness or based on our righteousness it is based on god's nature and god's nature is love and he keeps pouring his love upon us but the question is in order to receive the love of god we must receive it by believing in jesus by believing in his word and receive it only by faith that's exactly what first book of john chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 says see what love the father has given us that we should be called children of god and that is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him beloved we are god's children now what we will be has not yet been revealed what we do know is this when he is revealed we will be like him for we will see him as he is so this promise of the first book of john very clearly says that we are already god's children god is our father and if god is our father it is not because we are lovable people or because we have done anything righteous or because we are very holy it's only because he is love god is love and he keeps pouring his love upon us it is for us to respond to that love now listen to this brothers and sisters jesus continues loving us no matter what because his love is not based on our own performance and our own righteousness and our own right and our own holiness but the point is we ourselves can reject god's love we ourselves can refuse god's love and that is why he said we must remain in his love so he is giving us a command 
that he is already pouring his love upon us but it is our responsibility to remain in his love and you know brothers and sisters at the last supper if you read the book of john about the last supper the disciple judas was also present at that last supper now jesus knew that judas is going to betray him but look at the love of god jesus washes the feet of judas just like he washed the feet of the other 11 disciples he washes the feet of even the one who was going to betray him not only that when jesus comes back on the table he dips the bread in sauce and gives it to judas allow him to partake even in that meal it's not over still he still does not expose judas as the betrayer to any of the disciples except to john and you know brothers and sisters someone asked me why only john why did john not open his mouth and tell everybody that judas is the betrayer surely jesus whispered in the ears of john he says i'm going to tell you so that you will remember when the time comes that i already knew it because i'm the messiah i know who's my betrayer but i don't want you to open your mouth because obviously brothers and sisters if jesus had to open his mouth and to tell all the disciples openly although he said to them someone is going to betray me but he never disclosed the name because had the other disciples known that judas was the betrayer i'm sure that day judas would have not left that room alive we know what happened to the slave of the high priest peter cut off his ear with the with the sword and i'm sure if judas was known to be the betrayer none of the disciples would have spared him but look at the love of god look at the love of jesus he knows he's a betrayer he knows he's going to sell him for 30 silver coins and yet the unconditional love of god just flows out there into judas and it was judas who in spite of receiving that unconditional love of god goes out rejects the love of jesus takes those 30 silver coins betrays jesus to the to those tormentors and then he comes to the understanding what have i done and the devil lets him go to his condemnation so brothers and sisters when jesus said in verse number 9 remain in my love it becomes your and my responsibility to remain in his love because his love does not flow does not stop flowing it is a ever flowing fountain of love and we only need to believe his word receive it by faith and remain in his unconditional love verse number 10 if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love just as i have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love now here jesus is giving us a very simple formula yet very very profound he says by loving his father he abides in his father's love by loving his father he abides in his father in the same way he says by loving him we too can abide in him and you know brothers and sisters this verse leaves no room for any of our performance for any of our own boasting listen to this again jesus abides in the love of his father by only obeying and loving him and when he loves him he loves him by just obeying his instruction because he's got so much of love for his father so there is nothing that you and i brothers and sisters can do in order to receive the love of god and many people have misunderstood the scripture verse number 10 because it says that even in the old covenant before the new covenant before jesus could come it was the law of moses that was running and when god sent his son jesus into this world it says 
the people were following the old covenant and they were following the commandments and yet saint paul writing to the romans in romans chapter 5 verse 8 what does he say let's read that even when we were sinners god came looking for us but god proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners christ died for us when we were still sinners christ died for us listen to this brothers and sisters you and i were not born when jesus died on the cross you and i were not even present we only know that christ died for us through the word of god that has been written and come down for the last 2000 years but in the old covenant people obeyed the law of moses they followed the 10 commandments and in spite of obeying the 10 commandments the word of god says they were still sinners which means none of our performance can actually make us capable of receiving god's love we don't receive god's love because of our own righteousness but listen to this brothers and sisters what happens when we sin what happens even now when we sin our consciousness conscious conscious conscience conscience becomes unclean and it condemns us it is not god who's condemning us our conscience condemns us let's read what roman chapter 2 verse 15 says they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them so brothers and sisters from this verse it's very clear that god is not condemning us on the contrary if we read romans chapter 8 verse 1 and verse 34 it says that anyone who is in christ jesus he has no more condemnation there is no more condemnation for those who are in christ jesus let us read romans chapter 8 verse 1 and verse 34 verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus Romans 8 verse 34. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. So brothers and sisters, now that we are in Christ, and even though we sin sometimes, not that because we are in Christ, we have a brand new spirit. We don't sin. We do. Our mind sometimes gets out from the word. But God is still loving us. God still loves us. Let's go and read Romans chapter 8 verses 35 to 39. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this verse makes it very clear, brothers and sisters. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
no death, life, angels, no dark powers, no situations, no circumstances, not even the devil can ever separate us from the love of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we read the first book of John, chapter 3, verse 20, to 20 St. John is actually confirming what St. Paul writes to the Romans. Let's read that. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. So the Lord knows everything. Even, our, even God is greater than our hearts. Because he, when we have received the new birth, he comes and takes residence within our hearts. Our spirits become exactly like the spirit of Christ. And you know, brothers and sisters, what becomes our responsibility? Our responsibility is to remain in the love of God, which means that we need to keep the Satan out of our life and not allow him to talk us out by speaking the lie and telling us that God does not love us. Listen, brothers and sisters, the enemy in the midst of our trials, difficulties, our situations, even when we receive a bad report from the doctor or when we get depressed and oppressed or there is any particular negative situation of our life, the devil will give thoughts to us saying that, God has forsaken you. You are suffering because you did that particular sin. You are suffering because your ancestors did this wrong. They will give you, the devil will speak you out with every lie to let you believe that God does not love you. And we just read in the book of Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39, that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, when this truth becomes like a concrete in our mind, when we refuse to get affected by any situation in our life, no matter what our persecution is, no matter how big our trial is, no matter what our situation, our circumstance, or the negative report that we are facing right now, when we understand that God's love is like a flowing fountain, ever flowing fountain that never stops, that it's only by believing and entering into that fountain and receiving it, the devil can never speak us out of that love of God. And the most effective way, brothers and sisters, in order to keep the devil out of our life from cheating us and from telling us the lie is by giving him no place in the first place. And Romans chapter 6 verse 16 gives us the answer how to do that. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So sin leads to death and obedience leads to righteousness. And you know, brothers and sisters, the devil's job is only to speak lies to us. He has been stripped of his power. Today, unlike in the old covenant, where the devil was the ruler of this world, he had all human beings were slaves. But Jesus defeated him on the cross. He stripped him of all his powers. And today you and I in Christ have got the devil under our feet. So the only power the devil has is to speak lies to us. And when we don't know the truth of God's word, when we do not know the, when we don't abide in the word, we are unable to remain in the love of God. We are unable to receive that victory that Jesus has promised us. And now brothers and sisters, when we go to John chapter 10 verse 10, we begin to understand how Jesus says, the thief, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he says, I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance, have it to the fullest. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what John says in, his first, in the first book of John, chapter 3, verse 21. He continues what he says after 20. So let's read that. Beloved, 
if our hearts do not condemn us we have boldness before god so brothers and sisters we have confidence towards god even if our hearts condemn us listen to this again we should never let go of this truth that god loves us 24/7 his love never stops he is not a god whose performance who's, who's, who depends on our performance to love us when he understand when we understand that we are in christ jesus god is looking at you and me in the spirit brothers and sisters he is looking at us as sons and daughters and he keeps pouring his love into us so in order for us to remain in the love of god i must renew my mind i must stay in the love of god by abiding in the true wine by abiding in the word of god by abiding in that promise of god and the moment i renew my mind the power that is already inside of me the love of god that is already inside of me begins to flow out of me like a fountain and i begin to experience the manifestation of god's love now brothers and sisters here jesus in the book of john in the gospel of john is talking about holiness you 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 think that it is our righteousness and our performance that is going to bring us into the love of god absolutely not so many a times we begin to understand how will our holiness make it a point for us to renew our mind how will holiness be connected in us abiding in the true wine how will holiness help us to remain in the love of god the first book of corinthians chapter 1 verse 16 says that you and i when we receive the new birth have the mind of christ we have the mind of christ which means holiness is nothing but bringing my mind in line with the word of god let me say that again when i bring my mind in line with the word of god then only am i living in holiness holiness is not about external performances it is not about my external you know my external external uh, behavior or my external responses it is all about my mind staying on the word my mind being renewed on the promises of god and the moment my mind learns to understand that god has already loved me he has poured his love into my heart by the holy spirit now this mind gets in line with god's word and i am in holiness i am experiencing the holiness of god and you know brothers and sisters i want to repeat this statement all along in today that in order to stay in the love of god we must understand the responsibility to remain in god's love does not become god's responsibility but we become personally responsible in order to remain by abiding in the love of god by remaining in the love of god by staying in the promises of god by the renewing of my mind verse number 11 i have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete here jesus is talking about joy can you imagine brothers and sisters jesus is about to go to the cross is is just hours away from going to the cross and he is talking about joy to his disciples and then he's saying by what i am telling you my joy he says will be complete so brothers and sisters what do you understand by the word joy what is joy joy is simply knowing that the end result is victory knowing that the end result is always going to bring a manifestation of god's glory and you know brothers and sisters the book of psalms chapter 16 verse 11 says that in the presence of god 
there is fullness of joy. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And when we understand that when we have the presence of God within us, we are bound to experience joy because we know and we know that the end result is always victory. That when we are standing on the promise of God, when we believe in the promise of God, we can surely experience the victory, even though at this moment, we are going through so many trials in our life. Now look at this. Jesus is hours away from going to the cross. And he is talking about joy. Now, brothers and sisters, many of us know what is the meaning of the word happiness. Because happiness and joy are two different words. Joy is knowing that the end result is always going to be victory. It is like, you know, as though it is all match fixed. When you know and you know, for example, let me give you what I mean by match fixed. Say, for example, like my brother Gilbert and my brother Hector and like me who love to watch cricket. If we are watching the highlights of a cricket game, knowing, not knowing the result, and now because I don't know what the result is and say it is a game between India and Pakistan, India has won that game and the ball and the victory has been won in the last ball of the game. But I'm watching the highlights, I do not know. But my wife was with me. She's watching the highlights because she has already seen the match. My wife, of course, doesn't love cricket, but I'm just taking it as an example. And she's watching the highlights. While she's watching the highlights, she's watching it so coolly because she already knows the result. But I, whom watching the, who's watching the highlights, do not know the result. So I'm literally on tender hooks till that last ball is bowled because I do not know what the result is. And so I'm going through all those emotions until I know what the result is and I know it only when the last ball is, is bowled. But for my wife, she's sitting there very coolly because she already knows the result. And that's exactly what is joy. When I am standing on God's promise, it is just exactly how my wife feels when she is watching the highlights of the game. Because when you stand on God's word, the end result is always victory. Praise God. That's joy. So what is happiness? Happiness is only momentary. Happiness is based on my situations, based on my circumstances, based on whether somebody has given me a gift or somebody has given me a promotion, or somebody probably, I, you know, somebody has, I won a lottery or something. It's all momentary. But joy is something that is eternal. That is why in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we read that in spite of Jesus going to the cross, listen to this, brothers and sisters, in spite of Jesus going to the cross, the word of God says, Jesus counted it all joy even when he was going to the cross. Let us read that in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. So can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus was filled with joy going to the cross. What was so special about going to the cross, brothers and sisters? Do you think torture? Do you think humiliation? 
that agony and that pain that Jesus was going through, would it be any joy? Absolutely not. If he never knew that at the end of the cross, you and I who are going to believe in him were going to be set free from the devil and we were going to be sons and daughters and inherit eternal life. You know, brothers and sisters, the reason why Jesus went to the cross, he went because of you and me, so that when he would go to the cross, heaven would be our eternal home. And brothers and sisters, when Jesus went to the cross on Good Friday, he knew that Easter would come. In the same way, brothers and sisters, at this very moment, many of us are going through our own Good Friday. Many of us are going through our different trials, different situations, whether it is our health, whether it is our finance, whether it is our job, whether it is our marriage, whether it is our relationship, whether it is our children, whether it is, you know, any situation of our life. But you must remember when you are abiding in that word, when you are abiding in Christ, when you remain in his love, you know and you know because of his word, you can stand there with joy, knowing that at the end of Good Friday, there is going to be an Easter. At the end of your suffering, at the end of all the trial that you're going through right now, provided you stand on the word of God, you abide in his love, your Easter is just round the corner. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, the same thing is what's in the first book of Peter, Chapter 1, verse 8, St. Peter is writing about that unspeakable joy. Let's read that. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. So there is an unspeakable and glorious joy. So brothers and sisters, when we abide in the wine, just like the branch abides in the wine, it has not to do anything. It needs to only be attached to the wine, receive the nutrition and bear the fruit. In the same way, when we abide in Jesus through his living word, we will experience that joy because even though we are going through our own battles right now, we can tell those battles you are only temporary. Even if I don't receive victory in this life, I know there is unspeakable joy waiting for me for all eternity with Jesus. And you know, brothers and sisters, one of the tricks that the devil uses, which he used even at creation in the Garden of Eden, is the trick of deceiving. The trick of deceiving human beings into telling them that God does not want us to be joyful. Let us read what happens in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So look at this, brothers and sisters. The devil's crafty way in the Garden of Eden continues even today. In the Garden of Eden, he had no control over man. He was not the boss of this earth. He was still not the ruler of mankind. But look at the way he deceives Eve. He tells her that, you know, you are absolutely miserable because God doesn't want you to be the same as him. He deceives them into telling Adam and Eve that you are missing something. God is hiding something from you. God doesn't want to give you something because he doesn't want you to receive that. He deceives them in the lie. And that's exactly what he does even today. Brothers and sisters, today also so many Christians are living a miserable life are living a life, you know, very serious, very morose, no joy, no happiness, absolutely. Why? Because the devil has wanted them to stay miserable. He has made them stay unhappy. Why? Because they do not know the truth that God loves them.
God loves us unconditionally, brothers and sisters. We can stay in the fullness of joy through the abiding presence of Jesus. And there is another aspect that I want to share with you today. Jesus never said that he only wants us to experience joy, but he wants us to be in that fullness of joy. And brothers and sisters, how do we remain in the fullness of joy? Praise is the weapon to fight every negative thought that comes to us from the enemy. Let me say that again. Whenever we receive any negative thought, it is very important for us to respond to every negative situation or every negative thought in our life by opening our mouth and start praising the Lord and telling our God how great he is and telling our problem how small you are before such a great God that you and I serve. You know, brothers and sisters, praise becomes such a good weapon to fight against oppression, to fight against depression. I tell you, when I myself went through depression, I went through depression for almost about two years. In fact, for about six to eight months, it was such a terrible depression that I could not even pray. There was only one scripture, Thank you, Abba Father, for filling me with the love of Jesus. I just knew one scripture. I couldn't experience love. I couldn't feel the love. But I knew, according to the word, that God's love is unconditional. And you know, brothers and sisters, the moment I used to get those negative thoughts, I used to get the thought of hopelessness, the suicidal thoughts. The best thing that I learned from scripture was to open my mouth and start giving the Lord a shout of praise. Start praising him. Start just, if you can't say anything else, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you know, brothers and sisters, praise allows us to experience that fullness of joy. Praise God for Jesus that we know the truth now, that whenever we experience negative thoughts, we receive depressing thoughts. Our situation seems to look so huge before our great God. Tell that situation, our God is so great by praising the creator, by shouting out praises to him and telling him how great he is and our problem, which has been talking to us and making us feel our God is small. Make it under your feet because Jesus has already won it for you and me. Verse number 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, Jesus is setting a new commandment for us. What is he saying? He says, love one another as I have loved you. He sets the benchmark for the greatest commandment that when we follow that commandment, brothers and sisters, you and I can experience that same love that Jesus received from his heavenly father. And you know, brothers and sisters, loving one another as I have loved you unto death is what Jesus did. Many have wrongly taught, and even today you hear that, that Jesus was special, that Jesus could only receive that love and he could love unto death because he was Jesus. He was the son of God. And because none of us can be like Jesus. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, Living this Christian life is not something that you and I can live on our own strength. Let me say that again. Our Christian life is not what you and I can live on our own strength, but exactly what St. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 2, verse 20. Let's read that. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So brothers and sisters, our goal should be the same as Jesus, to love as he did by dying to self, to obey his word and to be a blessing to others. If ever you and I think that we can love God with our own strength, based on our own performance, with our own righteousness, we will be missing the point. But when we understand 
that it is Christ living in us, that in our new birth, Christ has taken residence within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Now it is possible with the power of the Holy Spirit to die to self, love God, and be a blessing to one another. Jesus simply saying that we can be a blessing to others only by dying to self, by looking after the interest of the other. Verse number 13. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, brothers and sisters, God kind of love is always char characterized by dying to self. That is exactly what St. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let us read that. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. So in order for someone to regard somebody better than yourself or to always put the interests of somebody else more than yours, it must always mean that the person is dying to self. You know, brothers and sisters, Whenever a person is always selfish, whenever a person is always focused on the self, the self is the root of all grief. Self-centeredness is the root of all grief. And that is why when we focus from self to the other, we will find not only will grief go away, but we will receive that joy which surpasses all understanding. But again, brothers and sisters, whenever we reach out to others, our motive is what is very important because 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 tells us something about our motive. Let's read that. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So at the end of the day, if my motivation is not based on love, even though I may reach out to somebody, even though I may, you know, focus on somebody else, but if my motivation is not based on love, it simply means I'm missing the point. Jesus was simply saying, love should be our motivation to follow him. We should be even prepared to die to ourselves so that we can be a blessing to others. Verse number 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So Jesus is here talking about his being his friends and laying down our life for a friend is the greatest expression of love, brothers and sisters. Laying down our life for a friend is the greatest expression of love. And Jesus is calling you and me his friends because he laid down his life for us. We are Jesus' friends when we respond to him by abiding in him and receive amazing access to him and amazing revelations from him. You know, brothers and sisters, when we are truly friends of Jesus, as friends of Jesus, we receive supernatural access. We actually enter to the throne of grace. We enter and receive amazing revelations from the word of God. And brothers and sisters, if you and I can understand that in order to be the friend of Jesus, in order to be his truly a one whom, you, him, whom he considers as our friend and we him as our friend, then surely we will abide in his word. And in abiding in his word, we will not only have access to the throne of grace, but as we begin to meditate on the word, as we begin to reflect on the word, as we begin to do what the word says, God, through the Holy Spirit, is going to give us amazing revelations, amazing new truths, which is not only going to help us to experience peace in ourselves, but it's also going to help us to be usable in his kingdom 
so that we can share that peace with everyone we meet through the knowledge of his word. You know, brothers and sisters, yesterday we read in the second book of Peter, chapter one, verse two, grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge of God and our savior, Jesus Christ. So the more we begin to spend time with the word, the more we begin to abide in the word, the more we begin to abide in the wine, we are receiving such supernatural revelations. And those revelations are not to bring any fear into us. They are supposed to give us that peace and that joy. And so when we experience that peace, we experience those revelations. We are able to share those truths and those revelations with others and allow those people to experience that peace and that joy of Christ. And now that peace and that joy allows those who come and listen to that to experience that intimacy with Jesus, to experience that abiding presence of Jesus, to experience that relationship and that eternal life which Jesus promised us. Verse number 15. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. He says, I have made known to you everything. I like that word, everything. I have made known to you everything from my father in heaven. And you know, brothers and sisters, we all know that there is a difference between being a servant and there's a difference being between being a friend. If we belong to a particular family, if I got a friend, a family friend, and there are people who work in that family, surely the relationship of my friend towards me and the relationship that he has towards the servant are surely going to be different because when we sit together in fellowship, He's going to share with me so many secrets. He's going to share me his life. He's going to share me his weaknesses, his strengths, his, his victories, his, his concerns. But he's not going to open that out with a servant. And here is Jesus saying to us that we are his friends. And he has made known to us everything from, our, from his father in heaven. And imagine, brothers and sisters, when we sit with the word of God, he gives us those revelations. He, the Holy Spirit begins to teach us everything. And now we begin to experience that sonship, that daughterhood, that being a child of the Heavenly Father. That's exactly what St. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. So we are sons and daughters of the heavenly father, brothers and sisters. We are children of the heavenly father. We are heirs of the kingdom of God. We do not, we do not, we become miserable slaves when we do not know how blessed we are in Christ. And just as a slave on this earth, just as a slave on this earth has to be a slave to his master, slave to his boss, slave to his particular situation, slave to his circumstances, slave to the, to, the, to the misdeeds that he has done. We, when we understand, just like St. Paul says, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul writing, he says, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he says, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, he does not experience what a slave on this earth experiences when his master treats him like a slave. But when you act and you become on your own voluntary way, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, you experience the abundant life. You experience that supernatural life. You experience knowing that you are a son, you are a daughter. Thank you, Jesus. You know, brothers and sisters, when St. Paul wrote, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first time I read that many years ago, I said, if St. Paul is a slave, I do not want to be a slave because I never knew what it means to abide in the wine. But now when I read abiding in the wine and St. Paul saying I'm a slave, it's more than a slave that I want to be of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because when you are a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, doing what his word says, obeying the master, being so sensitive to the Holy Spirit, being alert to every instruction of the Holy Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, we are the ones who are going to be blessed. We are the ones who are going to experience peace. We are the ones who are going to experience joy. We are the ones who are going to experience that abundant life. We are the ones who are going to experience that eternal life and that intimacy with our Lord and God. Verse number 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Now, brothers and sisters, as we reflect on this verse, Jesus is saying, you did not choose me. He's talking to each one of us. He's not only talking to his disciples. This verse applies to you and me today. It says, you did not choose him, but he chose us. He chose you. He chose me. Now listen to this, brothers and sisters. If the Lord chose you and me, for what reason did he choose us? He chose us because of his love for us. And the, and the very test or the litmus test that he really chose us is in our bearing fruit. Because he says, I chose you so that you could bear fruit and, be, and bear it and, 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 and bear it till it lasts, the fruit that will last. And you know, brothers and sisters, one of the things that we need to look today in any person who is sharing the word, whether it is a word that is being preached, the test of knowing whether that person has been chosen to do what he's doing, especially in God's kingdom, is in the fruit that the person is giving. Yesterday, brothers and sisters, we read and we reflected on the four fruits. Two fruits are the fruit which is personal and two fruits which are for others. For example, we talked about personal fruits which are the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of the spirit. When it was righteousness, we spoke about in Philippians chapter 1 verse 11. When we talked about the fruit of the spirit, it was Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Then there is a fruit which is given for others, which is the fruit of bringing others into the kingdom. The fruit of conversion. That is Romans chapter 1 verse 13. And then, of course, there is the fruit of righteousness, a fruit of holiness. And that is given in Romans chapter 6 verse 22. So, brothers and sisters, when we understand that all of us who have been chosen are supposed to bring forth fruit. And if we are not bearing fruit, then we need to ask ourselves, are we really bearing the fruit of the kingdom of God? Are we really being effective in the kingdom of God? Are we really being called for what are we doing, what we are called for? Because there are so many people out there today who go out sharing the word. And you find that when the word is shared, there is absolutely no change in that congregation. Month after month, year after year, decades have come and people have gone and done the same thing week after week and there has been no change happening there. But when they understand that the word that is preached is preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there is fruit that is born in that preaching of the word of God, then you know and you know that the person has been chosen and chosen to bear the fruit. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we read the book of Matthew, Matthew 7, we read that on the last day when Jesus will see us, he says, you shall know those who come to you in sheep clothing, but inside are ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. You shall not know them by their gifts. You shall not know them by their title. You shall not know them by their position, but you shall know them by their fruit. And these are the words of Jesus. So it is very important for us, brothers and sisters, because Jesus says, 
be careful how you hear and the responsibility of what you're hearing and how you're hearing is not depending on who's speaking but is dependent on who's the one who is hearing that word and when we know the truth of god's word we can be sure that we are hearing from the one who has been chosen by god because that word is the anointed word of god it is the word that is spoken by the holy spirit verse number 17 i am giving you these commands so that you may love one another so jesus is saying you must love one another all these things that i'm telling to you is because you must love one another in john chapter 15 verse 12 we just read that jesus commandment is to love others as he loved us so we cannot have any other benchmark brothers and sisters to love others but the benchmark of God. And then again, if we go to the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus was saying there that the greatest Old Testament commandment was the commandment of love. The Old Testament, which he spoke in Mark, chapter 12, verse 30, was the commandment of love. This means we can only love others if we have first received the love of God. And we can only give others what we have received from God. That's why it says, loving others must always include loving God. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the greatest litmus tests for us to understand if our relationship with God is right or not right. And how will we know that? Based on our relationship on the horizontal. When our relationship vertically is not right, when we have not experienced that love of God, we have not remained in the love of God, our relationship on the horizontal level will show it very clearly. Which means that when my relationship with the Heavenly Father, with Jesus through His Word, through His abiding Word, is strong, I'm remaining in His love, my love on the horizontal will be also so beautiful my relationship with everyone will be in harmony my relationship with the horizontal is a test for me to confirm that my relationship with the horizon with the vertical is right and you know brothers and sisters as i was reflecting on that the horizontal and the vertical it actually signifies the cross because the cross is one from north to south and east to west and on that cross, when we look at that cross, it signifies nothing but the unconditional love of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, every time we look at the cross and we realize how much Jesus suffered on that cross because he wanted you and me to remain in his love, to prove his love for us, we also today can remain in the love of God on a very vertical line from the top, from the bottom to the top. And then by receiving that love, can share that love, that God kind of love on the horizontal plane with everyone we meet as our brothers and our sisters. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for teaching us today how to remain in the love of God. Lord, we know and we know that you, Lord Jesus, are the true wine. And that we are the branches when we abide in you. Help us, Lord, to understand this truth by abiding in you to receive that love of the Father. And by receiving that love of the Father, die to self and share it with everyone we meet. By doing this, Lord, we know and we know we are obeying that commandment of love. To love you by doing your word and by loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and as you have shown us that love on the cross of Calvary. Teaching us this truth in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen.